Hej. Hi, welcome. Uh, I'm Fred Schauer. Um, the poster indicates uh, that I'm here as academic dean of the Kennedy School. Uh, that might not be right. Uh, I'm also at the moment the acting dean of the Kennedy School. That's also why I'm not here. I like to think that I'm here because I'm the Frank Stanton Professor of the First Amendment. Uh, not the professor part, but maybe the First Amendment part, the discourse part, uh, the person committed to the idea that on issues that divide us, on issues in which there are serious differences of opinion, the idea of talk, discussion, dialogue, exchange of views uh, is not only useful but vital, especially if we're all members of the same community. The idea here is to have a genuine discussion about an issue that uh, has not only been in the news for some time and has not only been uh, discussed at this university for several years, but also an issue on which there are deeply divided opinions, both about the substance of the issue and about questions of uh, process and tactics. To repeat, the idea is a genuine discussion, not a demonstration, not a rally. Uh, from my own perspective, it's a good chance to demonstrate uh, for all of us what I like to think of as the defining features of intellectual honesty. For me, one of those is a willingness to make things as hard as possible for your own views. It's very easy to make things hard for someone else's views. Making things as hard as possible for your own views is, for me, one of the hallmarks of intellectual honesty. The other for me, and it is related, is being willing to make and then to confront the best possible argument against your own position. Uh, if you haven't uh, tried as hard as you possibly can to say, what's the really best argument against what I believe? And then and only then said, uh, but that's still not good enough for me, then the position that emerges uh, is too easy. Uh, we're here in that spirit, uh, but I think in order to give credit where credit is due, uh, this event is not because of me. Uh, this event happened uh, because of the efforts of Sarah Karlinski, Sarah Lucas, and Frank Mitchick. Uh, Sarah and... Uh, Sarah and Sarah first came to me uh, 10 days ago or a couple of weeks ago uh, to describe uh, the idea of the importance of a dialogue, a discussion, and a discourse. Uh, independent of the resolution of the issue, just because it was an important issue in the community, uh, and they then described to me a process in which they had engaged Frank, who had different views on a number of the issues, to try to create a session in which there would be no yelling, no screaming, no just one side of the issue, but rather a genuine balanced presentation. In light of their formative role in creating this event, I'd like uh, Sarah Karlinski and Frank Mitchike to say a few words initially, and then I'll introduce the panel for the discussion. Uh, so, Sarah. Uh... Thank you very much. Can everybody hear me? Um, <clears throat> I really appreciate your remarks. Um, in being asked to speak today, 
um, I was asked to talk about my perspective on this particular issue. Um, and my perspective is very much tied up in uh, the meat and potatoes of the issue itself, um, which is as follows. I simply believe that Harvard can afford to pay its workers a living wage, but has chosen not to. The more I think about this, and the more I have thought about it, the more wrong it has seemed to me, particularly in light of the fact that Harvard University is the second wealthiest nonprofit institution in the world, second only to the Vatican. I feel ashamed that I attend an institution where the people who clean the bathrooms and the floors and feed my friends at the law school can't afford to put dinner on the table for themselves and their children. I think many students walk around this institution feeling complicit in this, but unable to change it. I'm sure some of you are wondering, well, hasn't this always been the case? The living wage issue is not new. Why the sudden student radicalism in, f in recent weeks? I have to say that the sit-in in Mass Hall, having that image of protest in front of me, forced me to think about my actions or lack of action in relationship to wage issues on this campus and take a position on it, and take a position on it quickly. To be honest, at first I was almost angry that the sit-in came in at such a bad time, near the end of the school year, so close to finals. And then I became inspired, inspired that my friend in case this G president had chosen to lock herself in Mass Hall for two weeks for a cause she believed in. Inspired that undergraduate and graduate students in the progressive student labor movement had thought so long and so hard about these issues. And inspired by the strong relationship between student groups and labor. And inspired most of all by the civility of the disobedience that I saw. More than even my PAE, I am proud of even this tangential role that I have played in this campaign. This forum event is a very important one to me because it affords us the opportunity to hear a number of different perspectives, to sharpen positions that we hold, understand that there is more work to be done, reflect on what has already occurred. I know that many people here on the panel and in the audience tonight have done a lot of thinking on this issue and on their involvement in this issue, and I look forward to hearing from their perspectives. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I didn't mention it at the beginning. Uh, Sarah uh, is a second year master's in public policy uh, student at the Kennedy School, also a uh, master's in urban policy uh, student uh, at the school. And before coming uh, to the school, uh, Sarah taught in Baltimore for the Teach for America program. Um, Frank Mitrike, uh is also a second year MPP student here an active member of the Republican Caucus. And before coming to the Kennedy School, Frank worked in Massachusetts state government. Frank? Thank you very much. And thank you, Sarah. And I remain uh, inspired by your commitment to this issue and several others. My perspective and my involvement has mainly come in um, on the end of, of wanting to see more dialogue and feeling that, in general, the Kennedy School has failed to do that on a number of issues for a number of reasons. Um, as some of you know, I sent a campus-wide email in the midst of the living wage campaign urging genuine dialogue and debate on the issue. I was spurred by a message from President Rudenstein, one that contained several compelling facts about the process that led to the sit-in, facts that those within the living wage movement had never, it seemed to me, addressed or shared as part of their campaign. While I admired their commitment to a cause, I resented the feeling that we were being spoon-fed a version of events and were expected not to question the merits or the motivation of those supporting a living wage. There were substantive, defensible arguments for the administration's position, and they were just not being heard. The respondents to my email, a good 30 or 40 in all, were almost universally in agreement. Many started off by saying they supported the protesters' cause, but felt reaction to the campaign was symptomatic of the genuine lack of dialogue at the Kennedy School particularly as relates to difficult issues like the living wage. But if this kind of dialogue can't happen here at one of the world's preeminent schools of public policy, where can it happen? That's why tonight's event is so important and worthwhile. It came about because people like Sarah, our classmate Sarah Lucas, and others in the living wage campaign, along with Bill White and Gordon Lee of the Forum, cared enough about a full airing of the issue to make it happen. I give them tremendous credit for their dedication to both the living wage and to meaningful debate on the issues of the day. And it came about because the faculty, administrators, and activists behind me, or in front of me, as the arrangement is, uh, were willing to make the time to be here even after the exhausting events of the last few weeks. Uh, 
I'd like to offer my particular appreciation to those who have agreed to speak on behalf of the Harvard administration and the commission that originally met to address the issue. It takes true courage to come into an atmosphere where you know what you have to say may be received with something less than enthusiasm. Your willingness to do so is a first step, a message to everyone at this school and this university that the doors of dialogue are open and that the clash of divergent informed opinions is not, is not only not a bad thing, it is the only thing that will truly allow for resolution of this difficult issue. Thank you. So as not to be more intrusive than necessary, what I'd like to do now is introduce all four of the panelists uh, rather than uh, introduce them uh, one by one. Um, speaking first will be Aaron Bartley. Aaron is a third year law student at the Harvard Law School who's worked on the Living Wage campaign since he first started at Harvard three years ago. Uh, Aaron is re was recently awarded the first annual Gary Bellow Public Service Award by the Harvard Law School. Uh, for those of us who were friends of the late Professor Bellow, uh, a uh, suitable tribute, both the honoree and the fact that the award was created uh, for him. Aaron has spent 21 days in Mass Hall during the sit-in because he is in the process of making up for lost time from those 21 days and is hoping to do better on his Harvard Law School final exams than I did 31 years ago. We will end promptly at 7.30. Jim Stock is the Roy Larson Professor of Political Economy at the Kennedy School, um, an economist uh, with uh, specialties in macroeconomics and econometrics. Jim served as a member of the original ad hoc committee on employment policies at Harvard University, uh, the Mills Committee. Uh, in May of 2000, the Mills Committee made a series of recommendations to the administration on the current salary and benefits package. Jim will talk both as a member of the Mills Committee and as an economist. Mary Jo Bain is the Thornton Bradshaw Professor of Public Policy and Management at the Kennedy School. Uh, she has been a member of the Kennedy School faculty for 20 years, uh, and, but has served not only um, in significant positions in the state government of New York, uh, but also served as, as Assistant Secretary for Children and Families Department of Health and Human Services uh, in the Clinton administration. During the sit-in at Mass Hall, Mary Jo was one of the many Harvard faculty members who endorsed the living wage campaign. Polly Price uh, is Associate Vice President for Human Resources for Harvard University. She previously served as Associate Dean for Human Resources for the Faculty of Arts and Sciences. Uh, she has served uh, on the University Task Force on Benefits and the University Negotiating Team uh, during various different labor negotiations. Uh, the four panelists will speak in this order for approximately five minutes uh, apiece. Then we'll have a brief discussion uh, among them and then the floor will be open for uh, No, uh, and um, certainly um, I cannot speak for members of that committee, but I would hope that that committee or any committee would uh, be in the process of listening and engaging before they uh, went public on their views. Aaron, the floor is yours. Sure, just uh, first of all, I want to thank everyone who organized this event. this event, I think it is, a step in the right direction to open a dialogue uh, in a very public way on the on the problems uh, of low-wage laborers on campus. And uh, I want to kind of preface my remarks by um, giving some context for what happened um, over the past three weeks, and in particular talking about two sets of conversations uh, that many students uh, and workers and faculty members have had uh, ongoing for the past three years uh, that led up to the, the sit-in uh, this month. Uh, the first set of conversations um, is one uh, with low-wage workers on campus. Uh, and I, I'm going to read a really brief statement by one uh, custodian who cleans a graduate school um, academic building on campus. Uh, because I think 
humanizing the issue and seeing it as a question of, of community value um, is the best way to become attached to kind of the, the premises and the conclusions of the living wage campaign. Uh, and I don't say that in a way to escape the intellectual, kind of the economic uh, neoclassical arguments that, that will surface here, but, but I think first and foremost, this is a question of community value and uh, thinking about how to define community. Um, so this is, this is Matthew, um, and he's a custodian, like I said, in an academic building here. Um, he says, my alarm goes off at four in the morning. That morning time is the only real time I have to myself. So I take my time, take my time, shower, shave, listen to the early news. The morning is the only time that I can walk. I don't run in the morning because I'm running all day as soon as I leave the house. Here's my schedule. I'm up at 4 a.m., out the door by 5.30, catch the train at 5.55, get to work at 7.15, take a breather, have some coffee, start work at 7.30. It's an hour and a half commute from Mansfield because I had to leave Cambridge when I ended rent control and my rent doubled to $1,100. I love Cambridge. I would have loved to have stayed. But where's the regular working stiff going to come up with $1,100 a month? So I moved to Mansfield where I pay $557 better, but still an awful lot of money to pay just to live someplace. Anyway, anyway, I work at Harvard until 4 p.m. I get on the train, grab a cup of coffee, throw down a donut, get off the train and walk 20 minutes from the station to my second job, the supermarket. I do bagging and stocking shelves until 10.30 p.m. I walk back to the train, take it home, get in my door around 11.30, get settled, in bed after midnight. Usually I'm so tired I hit the pillow and bang, I'm out. Have you ever been so tired you can't go to sleep? That happens sometimes too, and it just drives me nuts. Anyway, I'm up again by four. I've been going on that schedule for a little over two years now. Boy, I'll tell you, there are a lot of days when you're walking around in a fog. You're just pooped out. Of course, sometimes you have a day that's not too bad, but you can't think on it too much. Just go. You run like hell. I used to work Saturday and Sunday, but now two days a week, I don't have to hit the floor running. So that kind of represents uh, hundreds of conversations um, between people who have been active in the living wage, conversa uh, living wage campaign over the past three years and service workers on campus, um, janitors, security guards, dining workers, uh, grounds crew workers, uh, who uh, through these conversations, the community and the activists in the living wage campaign have learned uh, are uh, under attack um, by a set of administrative policies that over the last three years, actually over the last decade, have materially reduced uh, their living condition um, in the midst of uh, a cost of living increase in this area that has really been unprecedented and has exacerbated the whole set of uh, on the job problems we have at Harvard. Um, conversations with janitors uh, have told us that uh, the 500 or so janitors on campus um, essentially have, their wages have not kept up with inflation over the past 10 years. Uh, 10 years ago, the, the university began aggressively uh, bringing in subcontractors, uh, and that reduced the bargaining power of janitors, and uh, as I said, uh, made it extraordinarily difficult for custodians who'd been living in this area uh, their whole lives uh, to pay rent in the area. Um, many have moved out two hours away, um, commute two hours like Frank, and, and have daily uh, problems coping with the basic set of responsibilities that any working person has. Family, putting food on the table, paying rent. Um, same, same problem with security guards on campus. The university has brought in a whole set of uh, non-union security guards uh, who have uh, replaced formerly unionized guards who, who made a decent salary. Wages have dropped significantly. Uh, and the same set of cost of living problems and, and, and uh, having difficulty keeping up. Um, same process with dining hall workers. Uh, the university, including this, this building, uses um, contracted out companies like Sodexo Marriott that pay far less than uh, what dining workers uh, in other parts of the university make. And that process has put uh, wage pressure on those workers at Harvard who do make a decent living um, and has reduced their bargaining power with the university. Um, but besides the material aspect, besides the, you know, the, the daily difficulties of, of dealing with the responsibilities that working people have, um, I think the conversations revealed to me uh, 
a whole set of kind of more spiritual um, and community related concerns that I, I hope the living wage campaign has, has begun to bring out in the open in the community, which is uh, a feeling of disrespect, a feeling of lack of dignified treatment, uh, and a feeling of um, marginality, exclusion, um, and a feeling of um, questioning what, what values the community has here. And um, I know my comments thus far have been somewhat negative, and I think what has happened over the past month in particular is uh, a, an effort to redefine and to include and to empower in ways that uh, haven't, haven't happened here in quite a long time. And in that process, um, I think uh, a new spirit has really arisen, and it's gonna be a challenge and constant kind of vigilance that will keep that spirit alive. Um, but I've seen in the past month being in that building, outside that building, and across the campus, you know, 400 faculty um, putting names to uh, a statement of support for a sit-in, uh, which is a very unusual event. And uh, I think just a general coming together around the issue of needing to end poverty at Harvard uh, and needing to uh, redefine the community in ways that are not exclusive. There are ways that um, get us away from the perception of Harvard as an elite, aloof institution. Uh, and and I, I know from the conversations and, and the things that I've seen over the past month that there's a lot of commitment to moving Harvard beyond uh, that aloofness and that, that um, exclusion. So um, I'll end my comments there. Jim? Thanks. <clears throat> My uh, justification for being here is that I was on the uh, Mills Committee, which uh, submitted its report about a year ago. Now, in the context of this quickly evolving issue, that seems a bit like ancient history, I think. Um, but. Uh, our scope, the scope of our committee's charge, and certainly the scope of our report and the issues that we considered was uh, very similar to the scope of the most recent uh, so-called compromise committee that uh, was uh, recently constituted. So uh, I guess in my view, there's a chance that this ancient history might end up uh, repeating itself a little bit, at least in terms of the issues that are on the table. So let me talk a little bit about some of the issues that we dealt with in our committee. And then after that, I'm going to make some comments on the living wage issue per se, uh, speaking not really for the committee. Indeed, my comments aren't for the committee, but they're uh, just based on my own personal views as a member of the committee and uh, as an economist. So. Uh, what did the Mills Committee do? Well, we took a broad look at employment policies uh, throughout the university, focusing on uh, primarily so-called contingent workers, and those workers are workers in the casual, so-called casual workforce, and workers uh, who are hired by contractors. We also went a little bit beyond our charge and focused also on the so-called regular workforce, uh, which is primarily but uh, primarily unionized uh, workers who are full-time workers employed uh, by uh, Harvard. Um, much of what we did was collecting some facts and learning about the Harvard employment system, and I still don't know half of it. It's uh, very complicated, I have to say, and uh, anyone involved in this issue, I guess, has to learn some of these, uh, some of these complex facts. Our overall view of the employment situation at Harvard was that, in fact, Harvard is typically, and in general, a good place to work, and it has good benefits, and that it plays competitive wages. That said, we found that there are some very important ways that Harvard could improve its employment practices. One of these was by extending health benefits to a larger group of part-time workers, workers that uh, work only 16 hours a week. So that would, for example, cover staff that worked uh, two uh, weekend days. Another one 
was uh, to extend, uh, to ramp up or to scale up an educational program or a series of educational programs that would be available for on-site uh, English as a second language and GED type education for uh, workers uh, with uh, relatively low uh, educational backgrounds or limited educational backgrounds. And finally, and quite importantly, uh, dealing with some problems with the so-called casual workforce. Um, I'm not sure that right now is the best place to get into some of the, in these opening remarks, get into some of the nitty gritties of the Harvard employment system. But one thing I will flag, and this might come up in some of the questions and some of the issues, some of the questions associated with clarifying, uh, the clarifying workers at Harvard, it is useful to realize that there are three groups of workers at Harvard. There are these uh, uh, regular employees, um, there's the so-called casual workforce, and there are employees of contractors. The casual workforce is a real uh, mixed group of individuals, uh, quite a few students, uh, some retirees, um, and uh, their issues, I think, in the large, are quite different than the issues that uh, we focus on in terms of the, uh, that are the, the living wage campaign is focused on. I say in the large because there are some important exceptions. So one thing that we decided not to do in the committee was to uh, take a stance uh, supporting the living wage per se. That is a wage floor for Harvard uh, workers. And let me, there's some, there's some discussion in the committee report, but what I'm going to do now is actually give my own personal view on that matter. So uh, saying some things that uh, are mentioned in the committee report, but also saying some things that are not, that are just my opinion. And I think that there's a couple of problems with this. It's important to recognize, and I think everyone on the committee shared the view, and, and it certainly is my view, that Harvard has a responsibility to treat all of its workers fairly and uh, to treat them well. That said, the living wage proposal per se raises some complex issues. I think the first and most difficult criticism or problem that uh, this raises, in my view, is that suppose you want to implement this. I think there's a lot of reasons to believe that it's actually not going to help the workers that it's aimed to help. There's a couple of ways to see this, and the details depend on how it would actually be implemented. Suppose, first of all, that it's just implemented for the so-called regular employees, the, regular employees here at Harvard. What that provides an incentive for is uh, for the managers at Harvard to substitute away from regular employees towards other provisions of services. Um, we can manage, I think Harvard can manage that not being done through the so-called casual workforce, but it uh, would provide an incentive to substitute towards uh, contractors. And, I guess our view is that we shouldn't be substituting for con towards contractors just uh, as a way to um, save money relative to uh, Harvard employees. The second issue then, and of course this is what really is at the heart of the uh, living wage proposal, the proponents of the living wage uh, uh, are certainly aware of this. So that's why you then raise the question of, or one raises the proposal of should contractors employees then be covered by this as well? And that would, if you will, close this loophole for the Harvard managers. And I guess on the face of it, that sounds appealing, but just let's think about that uh, for a second. Um, many of these employees at Harvard work partly at Harvard and partly at other institutions. So what we'd be saying to these employers is that for the time that they're on the Harvard campus, these service workers are on the Harvard campus, they should earn one wage. For the time that they're working somewhere else, they should work an, uh, earn another wage. Well, in a large organization, that's actually a really difficult, uh, a difficult policy to implement. And it is uh, my sense, and it is uh, the sense both informed from hearing what some of the uh, contracting employ uh, contractors would uh, say, and also just thinking about this as an economist, 
that what I think would be a plausible outcome is that the large service providers, such as Sodexo Marriott, where there are large corporations, would not find it uh, viable to have this two-tiered wage structure internally for the same job. So what would probably happen, and this is all speculative, is that these large employers would then uh, withdraw from providing contracting services to Harvard. They would be replaced. I mean, these services do need to be there. Either they could be done by Harvard employees or they could be done by, um, by outside providers. But they'd be provided uh, by the outside providers would be as they'd be smaller organizations. Um, I, I would suspect with higher skilled workers, but in any event, certainly with different workers than the workers that we have here now. So to the extent that what we want to do or what the living wage proposal would purport to do is benefit the current employees of, work, of Harvard who are having these, you know, having these um, admittedly difficult uh, circumstances, I don't see that happening. I, I, see, I see that uh, as a probably being a mechanism whereby they would end up having similar jobs elsewhere and that we would hire different people. There's an additional feature of this which uh, does serve to complicate it, which is um, that uh, there will be, there would be a ripple effect throughout the Harvard pay structure. How big that ripple effect would be and what the consequences of that would be are quite uh, speculative. Um, my suspicion is that there would be a modest increase in wages at the uh, lower ends. Of course, some people may say that that's not so bad, but of course, the implication of providing uh, and indeed, there's obvious benefits to that, uh, but the implications of providing wages uh, that are above market is that uh, there would be fewer uh, workers hired in those uh, categories. So again, the uh, benefits of this uh, ripple uh, effect are, uh, are far from clear cut. So I guess on net, thinking about it uh, as uh, an economist, uh, I find the living wage proposal per se quite problematic. That's not to say that there aren't things that Harvard should be doing, but in my view, those things are much more along the lines of focusing on uh, aggressive provision of this uh, of, a, of ESL or GED type uh, programs to uh, these uh, workers. There you go. As Fred said, I was one of several hundred Harvard faculty members who expressed their support for the students in various ways, both support for the living wage campaign itself and support for the students who brought this issue so forcefully to the attention of our, our community. Um, I suppose partly I have to admit that uh, to some extent this just brought back fond memories of my disreputable youth in the 1960s. and. Uh, but I, I, that's obviously not the only thing that was going on. And let me comment on two things. Let me comment first on the living wage campaign itself and the living wage issue itself. And then secondly, on the, on the tactics of the, of the students, which have not yet been brought up, and the, the question of, of what's appropriate in a, in a community like this. Like others who have spoken here, it seems to me that the living wage issue is a is a moral issue, a, a matter of justice for our community, and, and not just a matter of, of economics or of, of market, what we can get away with paying. And I don't think Jim was saying that in, in any way, but it does seem to me that we approach this issue as a, as a moral issue, uh, an issue for our community and an issue of justice. And I think it's very clear that in the Boston metropolitan area, not just from anecdotes like the one uh, that Aaron read to us, but of pretty systematic studies of what it costs to live in the Boston metropolitan area, that this is an expensive place to live. Uh, and that for workers to be able to support themselves and their families in a decent way, um, some of the self-sufficiency uh, studies would suggest that it takes $44,000 a year for a family of three or four when you focus in on um, housing costs and childcare costs and the other costs in, in this arena. And so the proposal that, uh, that Harvard pay uh, not that amount, uh, but something a little closer to that than it does pay to its lower wage workers seems to me entirely justified. 
and something that Harvard is in a position to do, not only because of its wealth, which it has. Um, I wonder if the Vatican pays a living wage, by the way. I, 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 th I think I'm going to have to investigate that particular topic. Um, but that it does have the ability and, and the wealth uh, to pay that, but also because we, we are a we are a leader as an institution. We are not in the business of, of simply making money. We are here to both educate and to provide some um, leadership to the community in, in issues of morality and justice. And it seems to me Harvard should do that. Harvard is in a position to do it. Harvard is in a position to make that kind of statement. And as a community, we ought to do it. I agree with Jim that the issue of, of contracted uh, labor is a, is a complicated one. Uh, I like to think, though, that Harvard here, too, would be able to be a leader uh, rather than simply reacting to, um, uh, to some of the, of the market dynamics. And one would hope that Harvard might provide some leadership so that p other people would, in fact, uh, raise their wages as, as well. And I would hope that that would um, be, able to, uh, be able to happen. Many of the, of the recommendations that the Mills Committee made seems to me, seem to me to be very good uh, very good recommendations, important to invest in, in, in human capital. Um, but meanwhile, uh, people do have to pay their rent and their, and their child care uh, and their living costs here in the Boston area. And I think Harvard can provide some leadership on that. Now let me speak to the, to the tactics of the, of the students, because I think there is a, an important and interesting and difficult question as to what kind of tactics are legitimate and uh, appropriate for what kinds of issues in what kinds of communities. And I'll just say a couple of things, and, and we can maybe talk about this, this later. I don't, I don't want to make the argument that the ends justify the means. Um, but it does seem to me that ends and means have to be looked at together, that what kinds of means uh, are appropriate and legitimate in a community depends on what the cause is about, what the means are, and what kind of a, a community it is. As I've just said, it seems to me the living wage issue is an important issue. It's a moral issue. Uh, it's an issue which deserves to be brought forcefully to the attention of the whole community. Uh, to the attention of the administration and the faculty and other students. It is an important enough issue to justify making a strong statement and to do it in a way that people pay attention to. At the same time, had the students destroyed property, had the students engaged in physical violence, had the students done some of the other things that my friends did back in the 1960s, um, I wouldn't be making the kind of statement about appropriateness. I think that the importance of the issue justifies taking a strong stand. Um, it doesn't justify everything by any means. Uh, but I think that the behavior of the students in, in the way they carried out their protest uh, was very measured and, and quite balanced. There's also, of course, a question that, that would ask um, whether, or, or a principle that, that one might use that would say that more disruptive tactics should be used only after less disruptive tactics have, have been exhausted. Um, I don't really know enough to answer the question as to whether uh, everything was tried um, before uh, going to the, to the move of, of sitting in on the building. But again, I think I would say that for an important issue, um, bringing it to the attention of the community is important, and the students' tactics were, were quite measured in that respect. They did, after all, um, clean up after themselves. Uh, they didn't prevent the educational process from taking place. Uh, they brought the issue to our attention, I think, in, in quite an important way. And, and it seems to me we can then ask the question of what kind of tactics and what kind of statements are appropriate in an educational community, because that is indeed what we are. And as faculty and staff and students in an educational community, we have certain roles and responsibilities, certain obligations on the way we make our statements, the way we engage in argument, the way we engage in, in discussion. Uh, I think those obligations commit us to being a learning community, a community in dialogue, uh, a community that does not settle its disputes uh, by uh, fistfights, uh, but indeed settles them by, by dialogue and, and dispute. And it seems to me that um, whether the students had actually thought this all through before they went into the building or not, they provided our community 
both our internal Harvard community and the larger community with an extraordinary educational experience uh, by bringing this issue uh, to our attention in such a forceful way, by making us deal with the arguments that they were making, by making us deal with the facts uh, about workers here at Harvard and about what it means for our community. And so as we look at this as what, what have we learned uh, from what the students did, I think we have learned an enormous amount and as an educational community, we should thank them for that. I want to thank the organizers of this in the, in the Kennedy School. It's uh, great to be here so far. I'm pleased to be here. Um, <laughs> I also want to thank the uh, living wage students because um, every day of my working life, I spend trying to do things that will make Harvard a better place to work. Uh, we have a lot of cliches for it, to make Harvard the employer of choice, to make Harvard a great place to work. It's very hard to get the attention of this community about issues that affect staff, and you've helped in that effort, so thank you. Um, for the first time that I can remember, we actually um, have much more attention on the part of faculty, on the part of the senior leadership of the university, and on the part of the students in what is the lot of the staff who work here. And Aaron uh, used the word respect, which is something that he's heard from a lot of people that have been interviewed. Um, this is not the first time we've heard this. The HUCTW organized a whole segment of our community around respect. And it is something that I feel very deeply that we owe to everyone who works at the university. So my great gratitude to you for, for raising this and giving us a forum to talk about these issues which don't often get talked about. Having said that, um, I believe that the committee, the Mills Committee, made the right decision when it said Harvard should not simply adopt an arbitrary wage rate set by an outside entity um, outside of the collective bargaining process as a minimum payment for its employees. Um, Harvard has a good track record in terms of collective bargaining with its employees. We have seven unions on campus. Um, we uh, settled five contracts last year, and we'll do two this year. Um, we have a long history of labor on campus, and I think that we have dealt with them in a fair way, and we've been open and honest in our negotiations. There are complicated issues that come to the table when you do collective bargaining. It's not enough to simply have one issue, and um, anyone who's sat at the table with workers and with management knows that you often don't get far with just a single issue. So there are complicated issues here. It's uh, a very complex environment. Harvard is uh, more complicated than many other institutions or employers because of its decentralization. And we have uh, nine schools, the central administration, many tublets um, all over this campus who want to make decisions about how to spend their money and how to um, staff the um, for the work that they need to get done. Um, this is not done centrally, hasn't ever been done centrally in the past. Um, just to put it in context, Harvard is actually the third largest employer in the state. We're second only to Partners Healthcare and Verizon. Um, that's private employers, not public employers. Um, we have 14,000 regular employees and another um, 10,000 people a year work here as casuals. Some of them only work for two days, but some of them work as students during the summer. Um, or for uh, longer periods of time. In FY00, we had 76,000 applicants for jobs at the university. So there are a lot of people who want to work here, and we think that we hire the best, and we do well for them. I look forward to the new committee, the CATS committee, somebody calls it now, um, because I think that it will, the, having students on the committee and having workers on the committee will give new perspectives and new windows on some of these issues. And I look forward also to addressing the issue of outsourcing and whether this is something that the university should be doing. Thank you. When, when we are in the forum, we all work for Bill White, who is the forum director. Uh, Bill sent me a note a few minutes ago urging that in light of the time, uh, I go directly to questions. But 
what I will do in response to the questions is uh, give people a chance to uh, address each other and maybe get give several people a chance to answer the question. There are two microphones in standard forum fashion. Please um, go to the microphones. Uh, let me. Um, I'm. When I'm not writing about free speech, I write about rules. Uh, I have a fondness for rules. Uh, uh, four rules, please. Uh, first, identify yourself. Second, please make it a question and not a statement. Um, third, please make it brief so that we have a fair chance for a large number uh, of questions. Uh, and finally, one and only one question. Your second question is less important than someone else's first. OK. Hi, my name is Julia Appel. Um, I'm a first year at college. And um, I guess I was wondering, I'm, I'm sorry, I forgot your name. What is your name again? Me? Yeah. You. Jim Stock. J OK, I was wondering, <laughs> um, Professor Stock. In, your, in your comments about subcontracting, um, you had said that of the many ways to implement subcontracting, um, loopholes were created, and one of which was that if, um, if you try to apply it to the subcontractors, that they would, you would just be forced to go to other subcontracting companies because they would pull out because um, raising the wages for that wouldn't be a viable option. So I guess my question on that issue is, why not just stop subcontracting? Because then Harvard could control the wages that it's paying its workers, and it wouldn't cause a worker turnover, and then Harvard wouldn't have to deal with those kind of issues. Fine. That, that's uh, I, uh, less than two minutes. Um, the uh, statement that I made that might have been somewhat um, unclear, uh, let me first clarify that. My argument was that some of the larger contractors, uh, such as, I'm just speculating, I'm giving an example, Sodexo Marriott, which is a large corporation, national corporation, would um, find it difficult to operate with a two-tier wage structure for the people in the same people doing the same activity, one at Harvard and one somewhere else, and so uh, would then not uh, bid for that job, uh, and that would then lead to other contractors which would pay, uh, if we had this rule, ten dollars per hour. So if we had a ten twenty-five an hour rule, they would pay ten twenty-five an hour. So uh, another possibility, of course, would be to do the work. In house, if if the if the Sodexo Marriotts, for example, uh, were not to bid, then it could be done by Harvard employees again, being paid ten twenty five dollars an hour. But my point was was that those workers of let's for say for example Sodexo Marriott who would be earning less than ten twenty five an hour would in either of these scenarios lose their jobs and would no long and would not be the beneficiaries of this policy. Can I speak you to the contracting yeah. question. Uh, Jim and I have a completely different analysis of what what would happen were Marriott Sodexo asked to pay a living wage. Um, and I think there's empirical evidence on the campus, especially at the business school, uh, where food service is provided by a contractor, and the contractor has agreed to abide by a union contract uh, that the college workers, the in-house workers, have. And I think there are plenty of reasons why Sodexo Marriott would want to keep the contract at Harvard. It's still a valuable contract for them. Um, this is a very prestigious contract to have, frankly. Uh, and I can't imagine that uh, Sodex and Marriott would turn away uh, just because uh, it had to do a, a little bit of accounting to, to create what you call a two-tiered wage system. And I would also say that uh, the vast majority of, of Sodex and Marriott workers on campus are daily employees here. They don't go back and forth to different sites. So it, it, the implementation problems that you see, I, I, don't, I don't see them. Uh, yes, Professor Stock. I too have your, heard. Your the, name, please. My name is Randy Fenstermacher. I'm a door checker in the library in the uh, Harvard College Libraries. And Professor Stock, I too have heard the allegation that economics is an empirical science. Um, my uh, discussion with uh, workers from SSI, who are uh, outsourcing the library guards, and uh, also Unico, who are is a cleaning company here, uh, and they are they are already here. They are already expanding their operations. Um, and in, in, in particular, SSI sent us more guards to close the yard during the sit-in. Um, and I've talked to these people, and they get different wages when they work on different contracts. They already have a multi-tier structure in place. So I'm wondering, 
what empirical basis you are, are basing your speculation on. To a, to a certain extent, uh, a similar empirical basis is you, which is unfortunately uh, uh, not um, a comprehensive systematic analysis, but just discussions with various potential employers, employers, contractors, and employees, but especially the contractors. So um, I guess the relevant question, the relevant question is, is one of degree and one of uh, how, how two-tiered it is. And um, I, I think that's the, the actual concrete numbers I think it's difficult to ascertain. I mean, if one of the contracts is for 980 and the other is for 1025, maybe it wouldn't be an issue. If one of the contractors contracts is for six uh, is for seven dollars and the other is 1025, it probably would be an issue. So I think it's probably more difficult than we than we can just settle. Yes, and uh, we will be using the upstairs microphones as well, but the floor is now yours. Hi, um, <coughs> sorry, my name's Amy Offner. I'm a senior at the college, and um, I mean, I have to admit that I don't have that many questions um, because I, I've heard these arguments many times over the last three years, and I feel that um, many of us have adequately answered them. But I, I want to sort of, sort of raise the, the ultimate question um, stemming from this observation that most of the objections that I've heard this evening to a living wage um, strike me as either dishonest or honestly very trivial. Um, you know, the argument is made that Harvard decides everything through collective bargaining, um, and that's just patently not true. There are many non-unionized workers here. The argument is made that Harvard's collective bargaining, moreover, is fair, and that also is patently not true. We've seen the guards union get busted in the last three years um, through a very dishonest and um, unfair process. Um, there's the argument made that Harvard is so decentralized they could never do this, but in fact, Harvard has adopted a sweatshop code of conduct. Um, it, a university-wide mandate was made in a very centralized way. Harvard makes many of its labor decisions in a very centralized way, and it could certainly be done. Some of the other objections don't strike me as dishonest, but rather very trivial. You know, well, you might drive up some of the wages of the people who are making $11 an hour, and they might be making eleven twenty-two, and it seems to me that morality is worth that. Um, and so I guess what I would ask is, um, the, to the people who do seem to object to a living wage, um, how, how you could possibly see people on our campus who are suffering and who are working um, unreasonable hours and who don't have um, the money to pay rent, who are being evicted constantly, how you could see um, such a glaring moral lack in our community and consider these serious arguments. Polly, do you want to? I don't agree with you, Amy, that we have been dishonest, and I um, will leave that at that. But I think that um, Harvard does have an obligation to uh, do well by its employees. Um, it has an obligation as a rich institution to do more than other places. But at Harvard and at any institution and any employer, there are always going to be people making too little money. There are always going to be people at the bottom. And the committee that met last year, the Mills Committee, felt that it had alternatives to an arbitrary wage rate that would, in fact, help people move beyond their positions that they were in now at the bottom of the barrel. I think that our uh, bridge to learning and literacy, the ESL and basic literacy program that we offer employees uh, free of charge, no cost to them during paid release time at the work site, is an example of the kind of program that Harvard, as an educational institution, can offer and can do better and do better by the employees. Can I interject quickly? Yeah. It, it just seems to me dismaying and kind of fatalistic for someone who has a lot of power um, to set priorities and human resources to say that there are always going to be people on the campus making too little money to survive. I mean, you have the ability to change that, you along with administrators, corporation members, and I don't, I don't think there's any, you know, economic logic or certain uh, process that can take away your ability to rectify the situation. And I think continuing to say that there are always going to be two, two, you know, people living in poverty on campus, when you know you know that you can change that, I, I don't understand um, that logical process and. I think my, my argument was that those very people that you're pointing to 
would not be the ones who would benefit from this. That not all, but many of them, would end up losing their jobs at Harvard or for their contractor, contractors and end up in comparable jobs elsewhere. That is, as it's been point out, pointed out, that's an empirical question on which we have a variety of points of view and a variety of pieces of evidence. But I think simply saying that there's a moral imperative to raise their wages, however correct that might seem from a moral perspective, doesn't necessarily mean that doing so will provide the benefits or will benefit people in the way that you would necessarily want. So I guess that would be my take on this. Uh, upstairs, next to Frank. Or? Actually, it is Frank. Okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> because I'm again disappointed that, uh, and I guess I blame this partially on the fact that people who agree with me or at least have some problems with the campaign haven't shown up in the, in the same numbers as those in favor of it, but it has become again a um, dominant um, ideology unveiled here. But uh, I, in order to hopefully change that somewhat and really get a dialogue going, I'd ask the supporters of the campaign, one of the biggest objections that's been um, passed along to me and, and I guess by me is, uh, you've pegged this 1025 and I believe that's the number uh, I'm sorry if I'm a little off, that Cambridge, the city of Cambridge has pegged as a living wage. And it seems not only arbitrary, but false in the sense that the city of Cambridge, as I understand it, requires that its workers live in the city of Cambridge, in which case one can definitely say that it's difficult, if not impossible, to live on that. Um, but I wouldn't, it's very difficult. So I'm wondering if it's a little disingenuous to peg it to that number when the, the workers at Harvard have several options, including several much less expensive, although still somewhat costly, suburbs um, on, the, on the other side of Boston that are relatively well connected by public transportation. So I'd wonder if you'd uh, respond to that. Uh, sure. Um, 1025 was adopted by the students because it was adopted by the city of Cambridge. It seemed as, as good a number as any, probably too low. Uh, to represent what it actually costs to live in the Boston metropolitan area uh, at, a, at, a, at a decent level, at a, at a level where uh, you, can afford, you can afford to pay your rent and, and buy your food and pay your heating bills and pay for your child care. So I, I, I don't think, um, if, if the city of Cambridge thought that $10.25 uh, or about $20,000 a year was really enough to live in Cambridge, um, they might not have been doing their arithmetic quite correctly because I think that any ana the analyses that, that I mentioned were really looking at the Boston metropolitan area and I think your example from, from Mansfield or where I live in Dorchester uh, is, is equally good and would support higher than 1025 an hour and, and perhaps Harvard will decide indeed to go higher than that, which I would applaud. I think since I had just called on the person next to Frank, I'll call on him now uh, in the green shirt. Yes. Okay. Hi. I'm Ed. I'm a senior at the college, and I'm also a member of PSLM and of the Progressive Labor Party. Um, and I just wanted to say that the fact that the sit-in happened at all is a victory. Uh, it has exposed the hypocrisy behind Harvard's genteel facade, as well as the great inequality which is present at our college. Most importantly, it has energized thousands of workers, students, and others in Cambridge and elsewhere to fight against inequality and exploitation. This struggle must continue. With that being said, I must say that the uh, CATS committee is not a victory, even though workers and students are on it. We can't assume that just because it exists, Harvard is going to grant a living wage, even if, <clears throat> even if it recommends one. These recommendations are non-binding, yet worse yet, it, uh, it, 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 the committee begins the idea that Harvard, the Harvard ruling class is the enemy. So for 300 years, Harvard has been put, promoting racist I ideology. It has helped the U.S. ruling class launch imperialist wars, such as in Vietnam and Iraq. In short, it has served as a bastion of capitalism. Harvard has served the U.S. ruling class and helped it, uh, capitalists in exploiting, oppressing, and killing workers both here and abroad. Um, well, this is why I consider the Harvard ruling class to be our enemy and the main enemy of all those fighting for a just and egalitarian society. Moreover, in continuing this fight, the Living Wage Campaign needs to, unite, needs to be uniting with rank and file workers and students, not with uh, union misleaders and other ruling class liberals. In conclusion, uh, we need to be fighting not just for a seat at the table, 
but for the whole table, for those whose labor produced it. Now, I, my question is, does anyone... <laughs> <laughs> my question is, does anyone on the panel really think that this CATS committee is going to win workers at Harvard a living wage? Sure. Uh, I agree with the general sentiment that a committee alone is not uh, going to answer all the problems that working people face on the campus. Um, it's a start, and along with the other substantive gains that we that came out of the sit-in, including the renegotiation of the janitor's contract, which is a pretty big chunk of those not making a living wage, uh, we're on our way. But as I said in my opening comments, it's going to take a whole lot of community mobilization, vigilance, um, education, um, you know, possibly more direct action, and a lot of um, just commitment on the part of all the, all the community segments that came together over this issue, the faculty, low-wage workers, uh, union leaders, students, uh, and so forth. So I wouldn't think, I wouldn't say by any of the stretch of the imagination that we came out uh, of the sit-in with the total victory. I think uh, there, there's still plenty of work to be done. Yes. Uh, Reg McKean, Harvard Institute for Learning and Retirement. I may be the only person in the room still neutral on this matter. But let me steal something from the Connection program of a week ago that's been floating around in my mind and address it, this issue to Aaron and to Mary Jo. Uh, the, I'm sure you are familiar with the counterfactual that was introduced of imagining uh, a group of pro-life students conduct a similar sit-in in the university health services to protest the university's um, the University Health Services policy of giving count advice for uh, abortion services. I'm wondering what your reaction to this sort of direct action, illegal action, if the university chooses, well, il yeah, illegal action, what would your reaction to this be? Thank you. I'll let both of you in whatever order you want. My initial reaction is to emphasize that uh, this movement did not begin two weeks ago or three weeks ago when we went in the building. Uh, we've been meeting and discussing issues with Polly Price and with a whole set of administrators for nearly three years. So I think the focus on the sit-in, you know, obviously it generated uh, a tremendous amount of publicity and media and brought this issue out into the community. But uh, the sit-in itself is not uh, what our movement has been about. It's been about rational dialogue for three years and our attempts to uh, infuse these ideas into the upper realms of the administration. Um, you know, the sit-in was, was a tactical decision when we realized that there was a whole lot of coercive power at the top um, and there were a whole lot of people not listening to what a, a broad segment of the community wanted in this case. There, and, we realized that the only way that administrators would listen to, the, to this issue and the way that we would have this dialogue that we're having now is uh, by, by really saying in a very forceful way, um, six or seven corporation members cannot dictate the terms of you know, the living conditions of 1,500 low-wage workers on campus. And I think that's, you know, that's what the sit-in uh, accomplished. Uh, I'm, I, I don't know. I'm not sure how to address the counterfactual to hypothetical question, it would seem to me, um, you know, depend on a whole set of community concerns and, you know, my, my political ideology, too, so I'm not, not sure how to answer that. It depends on a lot of things. I would, I would, I would echo that. Um, using my own categories, an important issue, uh, an issue, but speaking to the counterfactual now, uh, an issue that uh, deserves to be debated, uh, the appropriate tactics for debating it depend a lot on what has been tried before in order to bring the attention, uh, bring the issue to the attention of the community. It depends a lot on how closely related to the, to the goals of the community it is and, and to ourselves as a community. Uh, and it depends on precisely what tactics were used to bring the issue to the, to the attention of the community. Um, would I support people sitting in to prevent people from getting health services? No, of course not. Um, but would I support them bringing the pro-life issue to the attention of the community? Yes. Could I, could I address that? I want to say something that's probably politically suicidal. I'm delighted that you uh, raised that issue because I think it 
raises some of the, uh, raised this counterfactual because it brings to the fore some of the tensions associated with this particular tactic. I think that one of the unfortunate things that address the question of the forum event, what have we learned? I think one of the unfortunate things we've learned is that this uh, tactic was successful and um, at least to a certain extent in getting uh, this compromise committee from the university. Um, as the counterfactual suggests, uh, this opens the door to um, other possible uh, groups that would be interested in uh, uh, supporting their views, which they would have an opinion as being as morally uh, viable or morally important as this particular group did. And I view that as an unfortunate development from the perspective of a university that should be focusing on dialogue and discussion instead. Can I jump in here? I, I would just like to have uh, Professor Stock's reaction to the fact that for three years uh, we wrote the corporation um, literally countless letters asking for asking to open a dialogue um, and met with every administrator imaginable on this issue and brought together a tremendous coalition around the issue. Uh, what would you, if, if you believed in this issue and were unable to even have a single meeting with the people who make decisions on the campus, um, how would you react? Not a single meet, not even a, a simple face-to-face -face dialogue. Well, or, well we, our, commi our committee, an issue, an interesting question is whether there should have been a student representative on the Mills Committee. And I was not in charge of that, of course. Uh, that's an interesting question. And in retrospect, perhaps there should have been. Um, as it was, we certainly met with members, uh, we met with you, as a matter of fact, uh, and uh, members of the uh, Living Wage uh, Campaign uh, on, I believe, a, a couple of equi occasions, and we reviewed materials that you provided to us. So I think, to that extent, to say that you were totally outside the loop is uh, inaccurate. Um, on the second floor? Sure. Yes. My name is Ari. Um, Polly, it was good to hear that you're happy to uh, have community attention uh, drawn to these issues, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to help give a little bit more. Um, the uh, HERE Local 26 is, is currently starting their, their contract negotiations, um, and in the light of, of all of the community interest that's been shown in this issue um, in improving the situations of workers in some way, not necessarily just a living wage, um, uh, how, how does that square with, with the opening offer from the university, which rather than talking about different ways to improve the situation of workers in, in, this low -paying, um, in these low-paying jobs, uh, instead decided to offer to take away some sick days, to take away grievance procedures, and other, and other situations like that? I've actually not been at the table on those negotiations, and um, there's, there's a lot of theater in uh, negotiations, especially when they get to this public phase. Um, so I would wait until we see where we come out at the end on this. Uh, yes. Hi. Um, my, my name is Rick Patel. I'm a student at the Kennedy School. Um, I just want to say I've been heartened by some of the conversation here today um, because I think from what I've heard, we're all morally agreed on the principle that people who work for Harvard should not be living in poverty. Um, maybe I've take, been mistaken about that. I'd like to hear confirmation on that, but I, I know I did hear that from, from Professor Stock. Um, the objection that I heard was that we can't do it, guys. Uh, we can't implement this. It just won't work. A living wage won't help these people out of poverty. And the thing that I'm struck with um, is how quickly we surrender to the um, sort of conjectural possibilities that have been raised of how it might not work. Um, can't we imagine at Harvard University where we're solving the global AIDS crisis and all of these problems, don't we have the resources to figure out a way in which we can use $19 billion to raise 1,000 workers out of poverty? Um, and shouldn't we get busy on that? The issue has never been about money. Um, Harvard could do this, they could symbolically do it in, in, an, you know, in a heartbeat. The issue really has been, is this the way we want wages set by an arbitrary number set by an outside entity outside of the collective bargaining table? And no, that's not what we want. Uh, this idea of the outside entity setting the wages has, 
has come up several times, and I, I mean, I think that what was demonstrated over the past month and continues to be demonstrated in this room is that there's, there's a lot of inside energy and a lot of uh, community support within Harvard uh, for this proposal. Continuing to say that some outside entity is imposing its will on, on Harvard doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. I think, you know, 400 faculty, thousands of students, thousands of workers coming out day in and day out over the past month has shown that you know, it, there isn't a conspiracy on the part of some, you know, the mayor or someone to impose this proposal. It's, it's an expression of a community consensus around a particular issue that has, has become important to thousands of people on the campus. And I completely agree with uh, the speaker's sentiment that with $19 billion, we could hire, if we had to, we could hire a team of, you know, economists to figure out how to do this. And it's not gonna be that difficult um, but Harvard has the resources to overcome the minor implementation problems that have, have come up today. Yes. Hi, my name is Jorge Urrutia. I am a student here at the Kennedy School, but in real life I run an agency of the government in Washington. And some of the functions that report to me include contracts and human resources. Uh, I just want to offer a little information, and that is that the federal government has for many, many years required uh, contractors doing work with, for the federal government to pay certain wages to their employees. And it has not been a problem in, in terms of contractors seeking uh, to get contracts from the federal government. Uh, so I don't think that this would be as complicated as you make it sound. Uh, you may want to check on how the government does it. In fact, I would be very happy to let you meet with some of our contracts people and, and they would explain that. Uh, also, as far as decentralization, I mean, I don't think anything is as decentralized as the federal government with offices all over the world, and yet this uh, seems to work. Uh, so I, I don't think it's, it is actually as complicated as, as, as it is uh, made uh, sound here. I'm not <laughs> let, me, <clears throat> let me restate my argument again. I'm not suggesting that this couldn't be done. And I'm not suggesting that if we, suppose we were to say that there's a wage floor of 10, 25 an hour plus benefits for all um, employees, uh, uh, either of contract providers, either of contractors or uh, at Harvard. I'm not saying we couldn't implement that rule and that we couldn't come up with enforcement devices uh, for that rule. I'm saying that the consequences of that rule is that we'd be hiring a different type of employee than we hire now and different employees than we hire right now. The, the, employees, uh, the employees who we hire right now would, in my view, not be the ones who would be hired under these other uh, sets of contracting uh, requirements. Susan? Hi, I'm Susan Eaton and I teach human resource management and healthcare management here at the Kennedy School. Um, I, have, I have a question about um, about organizations reflecting society and the way in which Harvard is uh, perhaps mirroring society rather than, as Mary Jo suggested, leading it. Um, I teach in my classes that we import lots of social tensions and lots of social issues, including you know issues about race and gender and so forth, into our organizations. You can never have an organization completely free of those things because they originate in the society, not in the organization. And what I'm curious about here is whether, in fact, one of the best things Harvard does, I think, is it, uh, in the Kennedy School is we have a seminar on inequality, which is, runs all year and which meets every week. And it would be fascinating to have this be one of the topics at a future uh, seminar. But it's my understanding, and I want to ask Vice President Price to correct me if I'm wrong, that Harvard, in fact, does have prevailing wage agreements with its construction contracts, its capital contracts. That's true. And typically, um, construction workers tend to be white and male. Um, service workers tend to be female and or minority minority or immigrant, and in a way, aren't we simply replicating the kind of inequality that exists in society at large when, uh, in fact, we could perhaps change that by simply not saying only on capital contracts are we going to have a prevailing wage agreement, but on service contracts we're going to, to make the same thing. And I take Jim's point that maybe different workers would be hired, but who's in charge of the hiring? Who would decide what workers were hired? Uh, it seems to me that that's the university's prerogative and that, that maybe this is a case where the university could, in fact, upset some of the organizational, some of the societal inequality within its organizational context. So I wonder if you could comment on that. 
I think you make a good point. Um, we do have um, uh, prevailing wage agreements for construction um, contractors. Um, we have not done it heretofore with service contractors. Um, it's not the norm um, with service contractors. It's something we probably ought to think about, and I, th I certainly think it's something the CATS committee ought to review. Um, with respect to, though, who would hire the people, I think when you're talking about hiring contractors, it's the contracting organization that would hire those people, not Harvard. Lynn, I'm going to give you the last question and then let each of the four panelists say a sentence or two in conclusion. Okay, thank you. My name is Lynn Lyman. I'm a second year student here at the Kennedy School. And just to state my bias ahead of time, I was inside Mass Hall for 13 days. And I want to um, first thank uh, the forum and the students for making this happen and say that I agree with Frank Michike, who said that uh, it's all too rare that we have enough dialogue at the Kennedy School. In fact, it was difficult to make this dialogue happen at all. The first time we had it scheduled, it was pulled from the books by our own Dean, Joe Nye, um, who said that this wasn't the right time to have a forum on this event. I'm glad that now is the right time, so at least we're having this discussion. Um, and I want to thank Mary Jo Bain for bringing up the issues of tactics, and I'd like to speak to that and maybe get comments, uh, particularly from the administrators and the faculty on the panel about this. My concern is, as, as people who didn't get the email, the, the general sense of what President Rudenstein said was that, um, that the tactics weren't appropriate for an academic, for university environment, that instead we should use means of academic discourse um, to bring up issues. And the question that I had for, and, and Dean Nye also sent out an email that basically said the same thing, and I, I spoke to him in person about this, and a lot of people have, have talked to him, and unfortunately he's not here today. My question is when an institution doesn't allow everybody at that table, um, where can deliberation occur, and how can we change the way this community works, this institution? This is the question part. Um, so that faculty who wanted to support us didn't have to do it anonymously so that workers don't have to find me in the hall when nobody else is working and thank me for sitting in that building. Um, there was just countless, countless faculty who supported us, particularly junior faculty, under the table because they're afraid for their jobs. Where, how can we create an environment where senior administ well, administrators on upper levels, I, I do have friends who work for the university, um, basically told me they couldn't take a position on this issue, that they did not feel comfortable being seen with me next to uh, Tent City outside Mass Hall, that they, they were afraid for their jobs. So I wonder what kind of academic discourse is going on, and particularly in a university, and particularly the University of Harvard, we should be in an environment where dissent is encouraged, um, not discouraged, so that we can discuss these things in an academic forum, in deliberation, in debates. I think these tactics were necessary because after three years, nobody was interested, nobody who held power was interested in the discussion. So my question is sort of taking the living wage issue to the larger, broader level for the members of the administration up on the panel. Um, how can we change this community to make it more inclusive? I think that's a really good question. Um, the I don't have a really good answer to it because this community has, while it processes things to death um, and takes a long time to make any single decision about things, it is in fact a community where uh, students and sometimes faculty are, and certainly workers at many levels, are not involved in those decisions. Um, I think many of us would like to see that changed and I'm uh, hopeful that it might. Do any of you want to make a final sentence or two or a bit more than that? I, I, I want to just speak to one, yeah. one issue on that. I strongly disagree with part of the premise of this, at least the part that I'm, I, can, I can speak to with uh, some specific knowledge. You stated that uh, junior faculty would, were supporting the uh, action under the table because they're afraid of their jobs. Well, the entire nature of an academic institution is one where we disagree all the time. That's the point of what that's the point of what we do. That's what the Kennedy School is about. That's what science is about. That's what learning is about. And those junior faculty 
should know that, and I would suggest that they do know that. And I, I think it's really uh, incorrect to say that junior faculty should be concerned about their jobs because they happen to be supporting uh, the uh, living wage activists. Um, just to quickly respond to that, I, I just view that as a kind of naive understanding of how the institution works. I, I know personally dozens of, of faculty members who did not want to take a public stand on this issue, although they agreed on principle and with everything that was happening. Um, more importantly, in my view, there were hundreds of uh, low-wage workers um, um, who I come in contact with and a lot of living wage people come in contact with who um, are still in a very intimidated state. Uh, and that has to change uh, immediately um, in order to make the community more inclusive and to create, as Lynn was saying, uh, real dialogue. I don't think we can have dialogue um, by corporation members and call that dialogue. That's just uh, power exercising. It's, you know, it's kind of authoritarian uh, uh, power. Um, are we doing closing statements or, okay. Um, I, I just want to say that I think this has been a positive experience. I think we're continuing to see a lot of consensus around this issue um, and moving forward, um, ha keeping everybody invested in the issue, connecting it to a whole lot of disparities, economic injustices that are present across the, you know, this country and the world, and thinking about how to creatively and powerfully address uh, the racial class um, disparities that we see all around us is, is really exciting. And I think um, as we move ahead, we're gonna, we're gonna uh, imagine possibilities that no one even thought, thought were um, you know, legitimate a few months ago, and, and that's, that's also very exciting. So um, I think one of the most exciting things about this issue is that it, it relates to our daily lived experience. Uh, we can see it all around us, and we can uh, do something uh, to address problems in our immediate environment. I was just going to say uh, that I was uh, grateful to all of you for providing uh, interesting and uh, civil discussion. I want to applaud two facts, I think, that are, are emerging both from this discussion and from the experience as a whole. First, that we do see this as, a, as an issue of, of morality and justice for our community and that um, we, are, we are committed, all of us, uh, to making this a better place to, to study and to work. And secondly, uh, applaud the notion that, that we see this as a, as a problem-solving opportunity. Um, it is kind of complicated. I mean, we really do have to figure out what the right way to approach this is. And I think the CATS committee is a, is a good place to do it. And perhaps next year, we can make it the spring exercise topic. Yeah. Paul? I just want to thank you for inviting me. And uh, it's been a pleasure. Let me, I want to thank um, all of the panelists uh, for coming, for speaking uh, intelligently and eloquently. I want to thank all of the people who helped make this happen, including Joe and I, who from the first moment was supportive of this event happening. It has happened. I'm proud to be a member of this community. Thank you very much. <laughs>